and welcome to Banking Transformed. I'm your host, Jim Maroos, owner and CEO of the Digital Bank Report and co-publisher of the Financial Brand. As the competitive marketplace in financial services expands and diversifies globally, it is more critical than ever for organizations to drive innovation and to differentiate themselves. But innovation and differentiation requires an openness to change, a high level of engagement from all levels and the use of data, applied analytics, new technologies, and skill sets that many banks and credit unions lack. We are fortunate to have Jason Hendricks and JP Nichols on the show today. They are co-founders of FinTech Forge and the Alloy Labs Alliance. We will discuss how innovation is not just the next big thing, but creating value across the entire customer journey. As it says on the FinTech Forge website, Balancing the pressure of innovating in a highly regulated environment while responding to the rapid changes in the dynamic fintech landscape is hard, but it's not impossible. In fact, innovative at digital speed in a scalable manager has been made easier than ever thanks to the existence of exceptional solution providers like Fintech Forge and the Alloy Labs Alliance. As I mentioned, I'm so happy to finally have my good friends, Jason Hendricks and JP Nichols on the show. Their organizations, Fintech Forge and the Alloy Labs Alliance, help organizations of all sizes build innovation processes that work. So before we get started, could each of you share a little bit about yourselves and your organization for those people listening who may not be aware of who you are and maybe not aware of your organization? Thanks, Jim. Really excited to finally be here. I was starting to get a little offended, honestly. I'm like, Jim doesn't think that I do good enough content to be on his show. So, you know, thanks for finally breaking down and letting us be oh, here. Oh, it's not a matter of breaking down. It, it's completely an omission by stupidity on my part. So I'm really <laughs> glad to no, finally no. get you both in the same place. Yeah, well... A little bit of our founding history is so JP and I got to know each other when he was at this little bank called what was it again JP that little bank we worked at <laughs> oh US Bank yeah <laughs> yeah that that little one not at all yeah. known for being I innovative and I was uh, running at the time one of the first challenger banks in the country called Perk Street Financial before that I had uh, headed strategic implementation today. That was something more like innovation when I was at First Marblehead. So I did have some corporate roots, roots before getting into the startup land. But when we came together in a post-US bank, post-Perk Street world, we looked at the landscape because we were getting calls from all these banks from as small as 200 million up to our largest is one of the biggest banks in the world. And they all had the same problem or thought they had the same problem, which is hey, can you help us with our innovation strategy or digital transformation, right? You know, used almost interchangeably. And our realization was they didn't need a better strategy. They needed a new way to execute. Maybe JP, I, let me pass the baton to you is, you know, with FinTech Forge, that's where you spend day in and day out. You know, your day is helping banks pick up the pace. Yeah, and, and just to pick up on the bio, uh, much like Jim, I started my banking career in Cleveland with the old Ameritrust, the old Cleveland Trust Company, and was acquired in 1992 by what was a little bank at that time, uh, Star Bank. And we grew that from six to 400 billion, changed our name uh, twice to, to become US Bank. And um, that's where I really kind of started to understand how the world was changing and how fintech was uh, really changing the landscape beneath our feet. And so I was lucky enough to be a part of a small team that um, really started to think about innovation. And uh, I can take no credit for any of the cool things that uh, U.S. Bank has done in the innovation uh, front. Most of that's happened uh, outside of my responsibility. And, and after I left, Dominic Conchero and others have done great work there. But I do credit Richard Davis when he became CEO in 2007. He said, look, there's a lot of great things you'd say about U.S. Bank, but being innovative isn't one of them, and we need to change that. And, and I'm kind of worried, frankly, that um, we have a lot of banks who, especially over the last year and a half with COVID, they've digitized existing processes, and they, they, they kind of think they've taken the hill already. Um, yep, we did innovations. We can check that off and kind of get back uh, to the normal thing. So I know we'll come back and talk more about that. But um, I, I, I'll just say now in, in kind of short fashion and an introduction to what we can talk about later is that our industry has developed a lot of really good managers 
and not enough good leaders. And as Peter Drucker likes to say, management is doing things right, but leadership is doing the right things. And as the world becomes more complex and uh, more disrupted, it's harder to figure out what those right things really are. You know, it's interesting. You know, I, I also, when people ask me in the U.S., what do you think is one of the, the best or the some of the best innovation companies as far as financial institutions. And U.S. Bank is one of the first ones that come to mind. And, and it startles people because they don't really know that. I said, you got to understand that it's a cultural thing. It happens throughout the whole organization, not in the flash and dance type way, but in an ongoing innovation iteration perspective. You know, it's no secret that one of the biggest challenges in the banking industry is actually having this legacy leadership embrace change and support the innovation process outside of the innovation lab and into the streets. Jason, you know, you, you've been passionate about this forever and you have a few great quotes and things you've said over the years, but how do you accomplish this for your clients with regard to actually having them get off stuck? Yeah, it, it, the problem with many banks, when we approach innovation, we treat it like a core conversion, which I've survived several of and will never do again, which is why I advise and steward innovation with banks don't actually work for a bank anymore because there's the risk I'd have to do another conversion. But you know, in a core conversion, you can predict with pretty high fidelity in week 32 on Tuesday, maybe Wednesday, we're gonna do the following thing. If you're doing something entirely new, you're not going to be sure what that future state is going to look like. So if you spend too much time trying to think through the plan and what the end state is, you're doing one of two things. You're either not doing something that's interesting and new because it's highly predictable, or you're creating a plan that you're going to stick to and you're going to ignore all of the learnings you have along the way. You know, Lightsu has a great quote that, you know, the journey of a thousand miles begins with a single footstep is you don't become innovative by thinking about innovative innovation, you become innovative by starting to act innovative, right? The cultural change is one of taking action, not about, you know, oh, we need to change our culture and then we can actually go innovate. You know, it's interesting, JP. I recently had Eric Fulweiler from Rival, previously from LoveNFS and actually uh, from uh, Vayner Media on the show. And we discussed the need to be fast and not necessarily perfect and to learn from everything. How is this accomplished in an industry that is so focused on risk avoidance? Yeah, um, Jim, I know you've heard me say this a lot before, but a lot of banks tell us that um, they're a fast follower and to which we often respond, well, you're half right. Yeah. There's nothing fast about what you're doing, yeah. but you're definitely a follower. Um, one of our member banks at uh, the Alloy Labs Alliance, and uh, I know Jason wants to talk more about that in a minute, but um, Quantic Bank from New York, the, they have a, a phrase that we like a lot. They, they really emphasize progress, not perfection. And this gets us back to you know where we were talking about in my history at US Bank. What we found and, and the research around this industry and other industries support this, is that the most innovative organizations have both top down and bottom up. Um, you need the top down to um, give permission to try things that we don't know what it's going to look like. And that's one of the things about risk management is we like to do things that others have done. Uh, most banks don't want to be out on the bleeding edge and that's okay. But when you're trying something new, like Jason was just saying, it, it's it's not the same as um, you know doing a core conversion where you know what all the steps are. You, you, it really takes courage and leadership and be able to say, well, we're going to explore here. And so being able to um, give permission to uh, favor progress over uh, perfection is really important. Well, the bottom up is also important because those are the people that are close to the customer, they're close to the product, they're close to the problems that are uh, trying to be solved by the product. And you really have to have both uh, to make it happen. Uh, but if you had to choose one, I I'd start with starting at the top and the organizations have to really understand what it means uh, to be innovative. And that means taking some reasonable amounts of risk. Uh, we, we always like to say, you know, we, we think of innovation uh, kind of like 
weight loss, right? And it, weight loss is simple. Uh, you just need to move more and eat less, but it's not easy. And innovation yeah. is simple. You need to try a whole bunch of things as quickly and cheaply as possible. Stop doing the ones that don't work and double down on the ones that do, but it's not easy either. And, and you really just need to give permission to um, test and learn. And if you do it as quickly and cheaply as possible, it should be okay if it doesn't work. You know, one of those things at the top, JP, that I think is so important is most CEOs did not get there without having, you know, this polish and veneer of perfection, right? Like it's very rare that you would hear a CEO talking about all the mistakes they made along the way and, you know, in their rise to the corner office. And that unfortunately trickles down through the organization. So at the top, part of the cultural change needs to be, we need to distinguish between learning and failure because we will do some things that don't work. And if we actually, if it was a good idea to pursue and it was a well thought out plan and it was well executed and no one got hurt along the way and we stopped doing it, that's not a failure. That's actually success. And that's not how, you know, if you look at most board books and how they're being measured, very few of those organizations say, hey, what things did we stop doing because we realized they weren't working? You want to see on time, on budget, right? And what the ROI is. And some of our most innovative banks within the alliance, their boards have actually, after some of the work we do with them, that's actually a significant part of the conversation in the boardroom now, which is, what did we learn and what did we stop doing? Because if everything we did worked perfectly, we didn't do anything interesting. Well, it's interesting. It starts at the very beginning or the very, what I call lowest, and I don't mean that by level of the organization, part of the organization. I was a teller when I started the banking business. And as a teller, you won't get fired if you don't give great customer service. You will go get fired if you don't balance your, your window at the end of the day. And JP, I think you started in the brands as well, but I'll tell you, there was more than a few times I put five cents into the into the the uh, cash drawer so I could get out of the office, and that's that whole perfect versus you know close to perfect mentality. But you know, it's interesting also. The everything that we're talking about really gets down to the legacy mindset. You know, financial institutions are making money today. So it's really hard for the leaders to think differently, but you see it in every size organization, things that just make you scratch your head. Most recently, and I, I've mentioned this on a recent podcast, was about a week and a half, two weeks ago, a major, as in top five financial institution, announced that they were going to be coming out with a brand new customer mobile app that's going to be better than ever before, and that they had been working on it for a year. Both parts of that blew me away. Number one, why do you announce something that isn't out there yet? And secondly, if yeah. you've been working on it for a year, I'll guarantee you that at least six months of that is already outdated in the real world. On the other hand, when I went to uh, Shenzhen, China in the beginning of 2020, I went to see WeBank. And boy, oh boy, WeBank was interesting, running four parallel um, cloud platforms to do innovation. They're, they're running around 1,000 iterations and innovations a month. And... New ideas go from ideation to implementation in 10 to 11 days. You know, so JP, how do you get an innovation mindset embraced when you're so encumbered by legacy products and legacy processes that really slow everything down? Well, yeah, and, and add to that, um, it, on top of what Jason said, think about most uh, senior executives at some point came through a lending role in their um, history and being right 99.9 or 99 point something percent of the time is is uh, the, the right level of errors in the lending business. So uh, there are times where Six Sigma makes sense, right? You want your network uptime, you want your audit committee, and you want your uh, loan book to be highly highly accurate, but innovation is about what we like to call one sigma thinking, uh, right? Eh, there's a 60% chance this is probably the right thing. Let's go ahead and, and make that decision. And it's it's difficult to do that, but the, the leaders have to give that permission to do that. And I think one of the other things is being honest about where you are today and how innovative you are. Um, we, we, we have a simple self-assessment. We work with banks on uh, uh, assessing where they are in terms of their innovation innovation maturity and where um, most of them kind of overestimate their their own um, level of innovation, but almost all of them agree they need to get better at speed, yeah. they need to get better at having data uh, to drive the decisions, and they need to get better at being experimental. And, you know, it's one of those things where 
um, you just have to do it, right? You you just have to say we're going to run some experiments, and um, you know we can't uh, game plan our way to what this experiment might look like. We actually have to run it in the real world. So, isn't this kind of what Alloy Labs Alliance? was all built around, was the ability to test, e even more importantly for small organizations, to learn from each other, to test new things, to continually iterate. What is the mission of this group of organizations and how well has it played out? Jason, I'm gonna start with you on that one. Yeah, so one of our realizations between in the journey of FinTech Forge, and the reason we have two different brands will become apparent in a second, because FinTech Forge, where we work one-on-one -on -one with an institution to create this innovation capacity, we realized that you're just never going to compete with Chime raising 200 million every other week, it seems like, in the heart of Silicon Valley and the companies they can acquire. And you're not going to compete with JP Morgan Chase. You know, you might even be a top 25 bank. And unless you've gotten your resources, you know, highly aligned, how are you going to compete with a Chase in a city? And a B of it, you know, like the things they're doing. And the aha for us was, well, there are some models for this. And, you know, there's some great, you know, collaborations out there like peer working groups and QSOs in the credit union space. But it wasn't solving the fundamental issue, which was how do I actually do more faster? Right. And you're not going to be able to go get a whole bunch of new resources. Chris Nichols from South State Bank, one of our founders, you know, said, you know, I couldn't go to the board and say I need tens of millions more every single year. And I'm still not going to keep up with that, by the way. So we needed to innovate on how we innovate. And that's what Alloy Labs is about. And the mission really is around how do we most efficiently keep up in the digital arms race while more effectively finding ways to go differentiate, right? And so, we, well, we've gotten a little more exclusive because we've realized you know, this is not uh, a membership organization where by showing up, you know, that's sufficient or you just get something for paying your dues. If you don't show up intending to do work, you're not going to get much benefit out of it. And so we've really upped the screen on that. So we're north of 50, you know, approaching 60 wow. banks doing it. And um, very, I would say they come in two flavors. Those who've already reached another Chris Nicholism, um, they've already reached their um, critical velocity, right? They're not going to go fa any faster. They're going as fast as they can with what they have. And the second flavor are those who are doing it, you know, and they're, they're running around the track and realizing, oh man, like I need a super booster. Like uh, this just isn't going to work on my own. I can't accelerate fast enough on my own. And, but I would say the common denominator is we and would not have known this when we started, we skew towards the more innovative banks. And I guess almost by definition, yeah. right? Like, you know, you know, one of my favorite phrases is the FinTech petting zoo or talking about, you know, innovation theater, right? These things that make us feel innovative. Like I went to Finnovate, I'm so proud of myself. I collected a bunch of cards. We did a follow-up meeting. No intention really of, um, you know, finding a way to partner and, you know, Th that's fine for some banks, right? They feel like they've checked the innovation box and they're ready to move on. Our banks are the ones who are like digging in deep on things. So it's interesting. You, 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 as you've mentioned, you, you kind of have already solved by the membership group that these people already have the the leadership issue and the culture issue kind of figured out, at least to a pretty good degree. They wouldn't be involved. They wouldn't be actually putting resources and doing things if they weren't. But more importantly, you're really giving the, the ability for scalability, for the ability to actually vet different partners to say, here's some things you may want to try. And you're able to have these smaller financial institutions act as one. And you've already checked off a lot of boxes that they don't have to check off again. You're able to bring the scalability to this. JP, you know, from your perspective, what are, what are your one or two favorite case studies you've had with the Alliance? that has really moved the needle from where they were to where they are today. So I'll actually let Jason give you a, a couple from the Alliance as a group. And, and as uh, he said, I, I tend to work more with the banks individually. Mm -hmm. and, and I'll give you a couple from that. Um, uh, one of my favorites was uh, one of our member banks was um, really working through, um, hey, we have done digital account opening and we're pretty happy with that. We need to reinvent branch account opening uh, right now. And they had a whole team and they're, they're looking at a different set of technologies, a different budget and a whole different process. And by going through uh, our, our process, we call FIRE, Fast Iterative Responsive Experiments. Um, one of the things that they realized through this was, well, wait a minute. 
you know, why are we going through this as a completely separate process? Um, in fact, one of the things that they they kind of applied as a principle in setting up their digital account opening was, we don't want to just um, digitize a brick and mortar, pen and paper design process. But they said, you know, the other way actually might make a lot of sense. So why don't we buy a handful of iPads, uh, work with the software we already have that's consumer facing and figure out what would we need to do to change that for the cases where we have in branch opening. They ended up knocking two and a half million dollars off of their budget because uh, they really didn't need all that new software and all the new process around that. So by them thinking through, look, what problem are we actually trying to solve and for whom? They were able to um, free up some resources and they're really excited because they have gone on to set up multiple fire teams um, to, to be able to address different issues uh, beyond that. One of the other banks, uh, kind of similar uh, situation with that, uh, in their case, they were looking to write a seven and a half million dollar check and they had spent a lot of time figuring out the technical feasibility, right? Will tab A fit into slot B? Um, yes, it will. They, they spent a million dollars in a year figuring that out. And when we got involved, we asked a really simple question, well, what are you actually trying to accomplish here and for whom? And we realized they really hadn't done any feasibility testing. And Jim, it made me think of what you just said about spending a year on a mobile app. I sure hope they were talking to customers along the way because you know th this, this bank wasn't. And what they ended up finding out by going out and testing with the customer, you know, and, and I'll give you the shorthand version, but the CIO had all the buzzwords. It was real-time omnichannel in the cloud, best in class, recommendation engine, blah, 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 blockchain AI, something, right? And um, what they found out was uh, the customers were really happy that they were thinking about them and suggesting best ne pr next product, but it didn't have to be real-time omnichannel in the cloud. And so there were a whole bunch of capabilities that people were chasing because it felt like that's something others needed to do um, or, or others were doing and therefore they needed to do. And they actually realized, no, once we're clear about what we're trying to do, there's actually lots of ways to get there. You know, it's interesting, that whole concept of the moving from the digital to the end branch. And, and we're seeing this also in research we're doing is a lot of organizations have completely eliminated the building for the online. They're basically taking the mobile and making it online. But as you said, there's some organizations now that said, you know what, rather than trying to rebuild our end branch, we're just going to cut out that whole process and almost make the branch manager like as if they're a customer opening the account for themselves, but now doing it for customers. And it streamlines so much. Plus it puts your mindset in saying, if we can fix it for digital, it makes all the processes easier. So Jason, I know you need to leave us because of another commitment, but before you go, what is the single most important recommendation that you have for banks and credit unions that want to move their innovation process forward in 2022? And in the same sense, where should they start? Well, one is get started. You just can't afford to wait. And the second you know, piece of that I would say is, get out of this incrementalism view of what do I do today and work backwards from what do my customers need from me tomorrow? And let me give an example of that from Alloy Labs. We spend a lot of time talking about, you know, skating to where the, the puck is going to be and what does that mean in a world where, you know, the it's just moving so much faster in terms of, you know, Amazon and Google and Walmart don't think of themselves as becoming banks, but they are providing financial services because they're going out to do these other things. So we need to rethink what is it we do. And so we talk a lot about this concept we call the edge of money. As banks, we're used to being at the center of money, right? The deposits coming in, the payments going out, the loans going out. For our customers, those are a means to an end, right? Like it's about being at that edge where the money meets their life and their broader goal. I don't wake up in the morning and go, I need a new mortgage. Why? Because going through the mortgage application process sounds like a lot of fun. It's no, I'm I'm having a baby. I'm you know moving to a new town. I'm buying my first house. I'm retiring and empty nesting, you know, buying a second house because I've been successful. That mortgage means something broader. And from that landscape and being customer driven, one of the things that we do is thanks is we run a reverse accelerator called the Concept Lab. And it's not an accelerator, you know, like you would find with you know, ICBAs or Y Combinator Techstars. They they've are they solve their problems in the right way. Ours is about how do we accelerate in the bank the adoption of new technologies and new services 
that aren't necessarily related to banking, right? They're not the yeah. bank tech companies or even necessarily a fintech company. And so a great example I'll leave you with, two of our banks, um, the Cooperative Bank up in Boston and Citizens in Northern up in Pennsylvania, after going through the concept lab, have partnered with a startup called Careful out of New York City. And what Careful does is they help adult children plan and manage the uh, healthcare expenses for their aging parents. Now, we found them because we start with the concept lab. We're strategic first in our partnerships and in the investment fund we have, which means we start with the bank saying, what problem statements would we generate? And then we go to the top tier VCs and we say, hey, who's got a solution that could solve a problem that looks like this? And aging parents was one of our problem statements. And so one of their VCs like, well, they haven't really talked about partnering with banks, but you know, guess what? Community banks have a lot of old customers. And so they're like, okay, we'll give this concept lab you know, thing a try. And sure enough, we found out a, a business model and a use case that works for both of them. And for the banks that participated, it was a big step into the unknown. They're like, we don't do things like this, but that's how we reinvent banking is we got deeper into the the customer lives and what their needs are. Yeah, it's interesting. This may be one of the places we're going to see the most change in the next five years is the whole revenue model of banking. We're just this week, uh, uh, Capital One has uh, decided to eliminate overdraft fees. Well, that revenue's got to be picked up somewhere, and open banking provides the opportunity to look outside of banking to organizations that want the customers that we already have and be able to contact them with, with offers that they'll actually pay for that capability. So Jason, thank you very much for your time today. And uh, I'm gonna continue with JP, but you know, JP is interesting. You know, we look at a lot of these dynamics that are going on in the industry right now. We look at new revenue models. We're looking at the importance of speed. We're looking at most importantly, the ability to succeed using partners. So as we look at 2022, my, my belief is that the ability to partner with organizations such as yours gives you the advantage of not only speed of movement and, and moving forward at, at scale, but you really are alleviated of the challenge that I'm seeing across the industry that I'm having a difficult time with whatever today is. In other words, because change is happening so fast, just keeping up with today is difficult but you really provide an organization the ability to move forward with your partnership, correct? Yeah, I, I mean, Alloy Labs Alliance is completely member-driven. Um, there are no fintechs or any other third parties can pay to play or you know uh, influence the favor. It's really all about giving the banks an ability to share resources, uh, share the cost, share the risk, and maybe most importantly, share the learnings of the things that they're doing. So everything we do is is member driven. It's really up uh, to the members to decide what they want to work on, and then we we kind of provide um, that external perspective that that really helps them. So within the alliance, we've got I think eight now centers of excellence around different topics of uh, things that the members decide they they want to work on. Everything from strategy and business model to cybersecurity to banking as a service um, to RPA and AI. Um, all different kinds of topics, but what, what we're focused on in the centers of excellence is not just a discussion group. What kinds of outcomes um, can we create as a group and how can we work together to create those? It, it's When you think about our industry, Jim, uh, you, you know this as well as I, uh, we look 95% the same as every other bank. We sell 95% of the same products and services backed by 95% of the same policies and procedures and really figuring out, so for those things that we're doing, how can we get the efficiencies and the economies of scale around those things? And then where can we make the difference in that other 5%? Right, where that's the edge of money that Jason was talking about, and and I think that's really what the future looks like. I mean, you, you and I both came up in the uh, '80s and '90s and 2000s in the banking industry, where everybody was executing the same same business model as everyone else, and those that won did it just a little bit better, created a little bit more margin, and were able to buy the less efficient competitors. And you know everybody knows the blockbuster story and it's kind of old and worn out by now, but I think it's still actually useful because that was the blockbuster model. And so Netflix didn't beat them at their own game, they changed the game and that's what's happening with FinTech now. And the banks that are winning are those that are able to be efficient um, and, and because you still have to defend 
and extend the core business. So how do you do that as, as efficiently as possible, but at the same time, look for opportunities to create options for the future and be able to explore things like uh, the partnership with Careful, Jason described, and we have some other partnerships that we've done. What we're looking for is not just the companies that are replumbing banking, but those that are reinventing banking. You know, it's, it's interesting because I wrote an article today and I, I referenced the fact that you know, most banks are still taxis in an Uber world. Yeah. And unfortunately, when we see the difference to be so great, we sometimes get focused on the next big thing. I know you're a proponent of continuous incremental innovation, or basically to put another way, to have relentless innovation. How do organizations change that mindset of saying innovation has got to be a big thing and how do they take put it across the entire organization to say what we've got to look for is that ongoing incremental innovation yeah so so i i'll I'll start with maybe one thing not to do that we see a lot and that is don't delegate this to your it team Um, because technology is so important and most uh, many at least banking leaders aren't really all that fluent with the technology it's easy to try to delegate this but most of the technology teams really aren't ready for that either right they've got a full-time job already with with five nines uptime and um, network security and uh, all of that sort of thing and this really is about leadership and strategy and understanding what to do Uh, one of the banks i work with um, hired a pretty expensive consultant to give them a banking roadmap, a digital roadmap, they called it. And so they said, okay, we've got our digital roadmap. Can you help us execute this? And they showed it to me. And it was essentially a shopping list, right? It was it was a, a, a bunch of check marks. Here are your biggest competitors. Here's all the, the features uh, in digital and mobile banking that your competitors have. And he, here where you have uh, no check mark next to their check mark, you should go do that. Mm-hmm. And I, I really challenged that and said, really? Uh, be, because what this is, is a roadmap to complete parity with a competitor that's about 100 times bigger than you are. And is are you sure that's what you want to do? So being able to take a step back and think about what are the areas that um, we always talk about it in terms of playing defense versus playing offense. Right. If, if there are some things that you don't have today um, that you need to have, uh, but they're kind of mainstream, at least amongst the, the 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 biggest banks, then that's really a defensive strategy. Go do it, but don't convince yourself you're going to win the game just by doing that. Uh, on the other hand, look for those opportunities where you can play offense. And the biggest risk here is letting off the gas before you get across the finish line. So how do you find those opportunities to, to really make a difference? Um, and then you know, you ask about, so so what do you do in, internally as leadership? Uh, I'll, I'll go back to our mantra. We, we just call it FIRE, fast, iterative, responsive experiment. So if, if you kind of are creating options for yourself for the future and you're looking at the edge of money for places where you can um, play offense and you maybe don't know what it looks like, instead of waiting for the market to define it for you, go out and test and learn and get out there and, and try some things and uh, figure out what works. Like I said, if you do it as quickly and as cheaply as possible, it's not failure, as Jason said, it, it's learning. So if I'm hearing this correctly, what we're really talking about is the need to have speed and agility and flexibility, not only in the innovation process, but in the solutions that you're trying to bring to the marketplace. Because if I'm not mistaken, right now, the the best innovations sometimes are being able to do it at digital speed. So does this provide a bit of an advantage to smaller firms that may not have the funds to completely revamp their core, but the ability to be responsive to the marketplace and to make those incremental improvements on speed, is this a, 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 an advantage that smaller firms may have in the marketplace? Well, I'm going to say yes and no, Jim, because I, I think if it were a binary choice and you ask most managers, would you rather have scale or not have scale? You'd rather have scale. Um, and if you have scale um, and, and you've got a big organization, yes, you have some hurdles around legacy um, thinking and behaviors and technologies that are harder to overcome. But you can create... Um, anti-scale, you know, intimacy, whatever you want to call yeah. it. Um, you can create small groups um, inside your company to go get that. You can't create scale if you don't have scale. But but that being said, um, I, I think the, the shorter answer on that is, yeah, it is an opportunity because 
Um, the chance to really differentiate yourself, find those spots to play offense on the edge of money um, are really unique. And we look at community banks in this country and they've been an important part of the fabric of society and, and the financial network that we have. But the primary differentiating factor for decades um, was location and, and having a physical yeah. location of, you know, X number of contiguous counties was a moat at one point in time. It's obvious that is no longer a moat to the business. So how can you redefine community? How can you redefine your customers? One of our members, we love telling the story of uh, Tab Bank. You probably know uh, the team there out in Utah. Uh, Tab stands for Transportation Alliance Bank. Uh, yep. They like to call themselves, um, the, they were mobile banking before there was such a thing because their initial customers were truck drivers. They were yep. owned by a family that owned a, a chain of truck stops, and they solved a very specific need, which was, Drivers get uh, from point A to point D, B, they've dropped off their load, now they have an empty truck and they need to fuel it up and get it home and all they have is a bill of lading. So they put fax machines in the truck stops, created a little factoring company and a, a prepaid fuel card. And from there they added ATMs and some other services and built on that. So they, were, uh, they have customers today in, in 50 states. So they were really able to use that um, narrow focus and small customer base to really narrow down. Um, if I go back to what I said a few minutes ago, if we're all still 95% of the same, if we do this right, we're all only going to be maybe 80% the same. Um, yeah, we're a bank and we have a balance sheet and we have uh, loans and deposits, uh, but we're going to have banks that are really focused on different uh, customer subsets and different markets and niches. And I think the ones that are winning today are already doing that. And I think um, those that don't do that will just be a part of that continued consolidation that we're seeing. So I, I asked this to Jason before he had to leave. What key recommendations do you give banks and credit unions of all sizes as they enter 2022? And where should these organizations start? So maybe the best place to start is where we start both in the boardroom and in the classroom where we teach at some of the leading graduate schools of banking. Let's start by defining innovation. And in our mind, innovation is implementing new ideas that create value. Um, now, most everybody gets the new ideas part. But A, they've got to be implemented. Um, you know, having a good idea is worthless. Uh, you, you need to implement it. And understanding how and where you're going to create the value is the part that really is the unique thing um, for everybody. So while a lot of organizations are really trying to reduce operating costs and get the efficiency ratio down right now, that's fine. And you can innovate around that. Um, but you can also innovate in ways that don't involve technology. One of our banks said one of the things they were most proud of, they, they said, well, we kind of feel embarrassed about this. Um, but if we're honest, one of the best things we did in the pandemic was cut a mail slot into the door. It was a 1930 solution, uh, but they had customers who couldn't come into the bank and make deposits and they, they cut a mail slot in and were able to process those. But that's innovation, right? They understood the problem that they were trying to solve. Yep. And so I, I think embracing that throughout the organization and, and like I said, not delegating that to IT. It really needs to happen um, all over uh, the organization. And then um, uh, understanding where you're trying to take the organization, even if you don't understand what the final destination looks like. Uh, Lewis Carroll liked to say, if you don't know where you're going, any road will get you there. Uh, but trying to understand at least, look, if these are our customers and this is where we're trying to uh, go, then let's pursue the, those opportunities. Let's innovate around that. Let's put that in our strategic plan. We always like to say the problem with most strategic plans is they're neither strategic nor plans. Um, they're, they're a collection of tasks that, that they feel they need to get done. And then many times that's driven by um, that parity checklist that we talked about a few minutes ago. So really understanding where you can make a difference and uh, just doing the reps, right? Get out there and, and try some things. And uh, if it doesn't work, try the next thing. You know, Simon Sinek said a, quite a while ago, but it probably more important now than ever is every company should really pretty much start with their why. Yep. Figure out what you're going to do and what you want to be. And as you said, you can build brand new segments or double down on segments that perform really well for you, which allows you also the opportunity as we get into an open bank environment to find partners that also want to reach these same companies, completely changing revenue models. You know, JP, I, I can't tell you how much I appreciate you being on the show. 
we have known each other for a lot of years in in many different ways. We've we've we realized we we followed parallel paths at different points in our career, both yeah. myself and you, and and my wife and you in certain ways. Yeah, and you know. You know, it's important, as I say in every single podcast I have, more than ever, it is important for financial institutions to partner with those organizations that can give you speed, agility, and flexibility while getting to the destination fast and you can get there on yourselves. So with that in mind, how do people reach you and Jason if they want to discuss how FinTech Forge and the Alloy Labs Alliance can help them in the innovation process? Oh, great. Thanks, Jim. Yeah, I, it's funny. I was laughing as you were saying that we have known each other a long time and none of that was the times we actually lived in the same city, uh, <laughs> exactly. which was even longer yeah. than the time we've known each other. Yeah. Um, so uh, we're both pretty active on social media, um, but alloylabs.com, uh, it's jp at alloylabs.com and jason at alloylabs.com. It's, it's pretty easy to find us. Uh, but yeah, if you've... Um, uh, you're interested in this, you want to talk more about it, we, we put a fair amount out on our blog and we talk about uh, these things. And like I said, we, we teach at a lot of the graduate schools of banking. So we're, we're happy to talk with folks, whether it's about um, their bank individually or um, how they can benefit from partnering with others through the Alloy Labs Alliance. You know, it's interesting, JP, I've known both of you for a long time. And and anybody who's listening, if if you want the starting point, if you want to just pick up the phone and talk to somebody, these are the people that do it. Because more than anything else, more than the business that are in, they have a passion to help. This is how the whole organization got started in the beginning. It is what they're doing with Alloy Labs Alliance. It's what they do with FinTech Forge. But most importantly, it's the passion for serving others that makes them special in the marketplace. And, and uh, I cannot say enough how much following JP and following Jason on Twitter, on LinkedIn, on Facebook, you know, all the different channels, but also reading what they write gives you a great head start in the marketplace. Thank you so much, JP, and certainly pass on my thanks to Jason as well. Will do. Thanks for the kind words. Thanks for listening to Banking Transform, the winner of two communicator awards for podcast excellence. We appreciate the support you have provided and hope you continue to follow Bank and Transform on your favorite podcast app. In addition, if you can take a little time to show us some love in the form of review, we'd really appreciate it. Finally, be sure to catch my recent articles on the financial brand and check out the amazing research we're doing for the Digital Bank Report. This has been a production of Evergreen Podcasts. A special thank you to our producer, Leah Longbreak, audio engineer, Sean Roll Hoffman, and video producer, Will Pritz. I'm your host, Jim Roos. Until next time, remember, the secret of change is to focus all your energy, not on fighting the old, but on building the new.